Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. This episode is again a little different, but the topic and the conversation I'm going to have with my special guest are absolutely essential to our understanding how life really works and how we can enhance our communication with all the consciousnesses in the quantum field. Connecting and communicating with animals is the greatest joy I can think of. Our pets give us unconditional love, which means that they love us just because we are. They are often like our adopted children, bringing in so much joy, laughter, and emotional support into our life and teach us so much about us and our interaction with the world. Then there are farm animals, and our treatment of them is a big topic and separate topic in its own right, perhaps for another episode. And of course, there is the wildlife, which we unexpectedly encounter while camping or traveling. Mammals, birds, reptiles, fish. And also protect from extinction and care for any injured or lost ones, like for example, the koalas in Australia. All creatures great and small are very dear to my heart, and I can talk about them for hours. (laughs) And so I'm delighted to bring you this heartwarming conversation with my very special guest, Shannon Katz. Shannon is an intuitive animal communicator and educator and Reiki master practitioner with animal love languages. Shannon works through the universal love language of all species, deep listening, to connect with her pet clients. Deep listening activates empathy allowing Shannon to literally feel what an animal is feeling, listening to their thoughts, experience what they are experiencing, and then relay all that information to the pet parent or animal guardian. Shannon welcomes all pet species and their parents to enjoy the transformative experience of animal communication and Reiki healing. You will find more information about Shannon and her work in the show notes at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Hello, Shannon. So lovely to meet you. Welcome to Quantum Living. Thank you. It is my absolute honor and joy to be here. (laughs) And of course, you know that that's how our paths crossed when I discovered your podcast through a mutual colleague and trotted on over to your horse magic (laughs) episode. And I just (laughs) fell in love and I wanted to reach out to you. And that is how we ended up speaking today. And you just heard my avian sidekick muse and soulmate in the background, Petal Cuts. Yes. And Petal is a very important important part of my life and work. I am just like you. I feel like I could talk about pets and animals and nature for hours. <laughs> Isn't that right, Petal? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I'm so glad that we have connected. And well, of course, this will be an amazing conversation. Of course. So to begin with, could you please share with us your personal story? How did you become interested in and involved in animal communication? I love this question. And you may have listeners in your community who will really relate to this because 
when I was growing up, I used to think that being intuitive, having psychic insight was something that only special people got. You were either born with it or you just were out of luck. And so for me, my life routed me in a rather circuitous fashion towards hiring animal communicators. And it first unfolded when my parrot at the time, Pearl, had developed some mysterious health issues and the veterinarians couldn't find the cause. And that led me to working with animal communicators. And I hired animal communicators for years. I never had a problem believing that it was possible to communicate across species boundaries. I didn't have any kind of mental block or anything against it. I just didn't believe that I could do it. And over the years, as I hired communicators to help facilitate all kinds of different things, everything from pets passing out of their physical body to pets getting lost or going on adventures to new pets joining my family. Over time, one of the communicators that I worked with regularly started dropping hints that I could do this. And she was teaching classes and I wasn't open to that idea. I just didn't perceive myself as somebody who was intuitive or psychic in any way. And I just felt a very low vote of self-confidence in my ability to do that. And so I didn't really hear her. She would say it and I wouldn't, if you've ever had that experience of somebody saying something and you actually just don't even hear it, you don't have any frame of reference for that. And then one day I was turning 50 and my life was just falling apart. Right as I turned 50, my very best friend in the world unexpectedly died. And my relationship of 15 years ended. My choice, but it was, and long overdue, but it was still really tough. Then my dad began his final transition very suddenly. And it just felt like one connection, one link, one important relationship after another was just falling away. And my whole life, it just kind of felt like it was crumbling down. And right in the middle of all of this, I was meditating one morning. Probably my saving grace is that I've had a meditation practice since I was 19. And I was meditating and all of a sudden I heard this little, small, still voice that I've come to trust over the years. And it said to me very calmly and very confidently, you are an animal sensitive and intuitive. And I thought to myself, that sounds important, but I have no idea what it means. And Luckily, luckily, as luck and serendipity and high vibration intentions would have it, I was studying with a wonderful intuitive teacher. And for my 50th birthday, I received as a gift a coaching session with her. And I asked her, I said, this is one of my big questions is I feel like there's a message for me here, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what an animal sensitive and intuitive is. <laughs> and she said, oh, brilliant, an animal communicator. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I really was like, oh my goodness. And I said, well, you know, a friend of mine and I have been talking about possibly just taking a class together for fun. And she said, taking a class? Like there are animals waiting to talk to you. You need to be doing this already. And so long story short, I did most of my studies, my formal studies and my practicum, my practice sessions from my dad's bedside in hospital and rehab centers. And then at home during his transition period. And not long after I launched animal love languages And the interesting thing about animal love languages is that the animals gave me that name as well. And I'm still unpacking what it means. And a big part of following this intuitive path for me has been the humility of letting the animals lead 
the way, letting the animals reveal one right next step and then another. So that is the short story of how I became an animal communicator and not too terribly long after I began offering sessions, I had a group of clients. All Really, they all, all booked in the same week. All asked me if I taught. And my response was, uh, no. And I, again, quote unquote, luckily, was working with a wonderful business coach at the time. And I went to her and I said, don't you think it's a little early in my professional development for me to start teaching? I've had a request. And she said, absolutely not. Just teach what you know. It will be enough. And that's how I started teaching. And right at that same time, in fact, as my dad started his decline, my best friend who passed when I was turning 50, she had been a Reiki master. And we talked a lot about her work as a volunteer in hospice. And I had completely forgotten that I had been attuned about 25 years prior. And when she passed and my dad began his decline, my hands all of a sudden felt like they turned on. I would go to visit my parents and my dad would walk by and my hands would lift themselves up and just follow him. And I thought, I better get reattuned because I don't remember anything. Maybe I can help him. That was my only goal was just to be of service to him. And I was able to do that, but I wasn't able to complete my Reiki tunement process before he passed. So that's how these three elements came together for me and anyone who's listening, who's maybe traveling the intuitive or the psychic path later in life and is wondering, is it too late for me? I want you to know it's never too late. When we follow our right path, it's amazing how rapidly and how completely and how wonderfully every the, the, the whole world, and that's what you talk about, the whole world can align to open up those doors and make our pathway forward clear. Beautiful. In my introduction, I said that this episode is somewhat different to my usual topics that I like to cover, but not really. <laughs> I found it very interesting that you saw a connection between the uh, interspecies communication, especially humans with animals, and the spiritual slash quantum nature of reality we live in, which is what I teach. Could you please speak to this nexus? What are the spiritual aspects of interspecies communication and how recognizing and understanding those aspects by us can support this process? This is such a wonderful, wonderful question. And for me, it really boils down to the root word of spiritual, which is spirit, which I receive as energy. And fundamentally speaking, whether we're looking at our biology, our mental processes, our emotional pathways, or the mysterious alchemy that makes each of us unique and here, something that truly is the mystery we'll never be able to fully unfold or understand. We are so much more alike than different. Even at the, the research and the scientific level to look at sharing 60% of our DNA with a fruit fly or a banana, the, the differences are infinitesimal. The similarities are vast. And 
at that core level, we can look at, we've all got a physical body, at least on this side in the 3D dimension. We've all got the same basic emotions and many of the same responses to different life situations. And this is, this is documented. We've, we've traveled quite a long way from the days when non-human animals were viewed as non-sentient, non-feeling, non-thinking, autom- automatons, robotic. And with the same basic wiring, we, we all have a fight or flight. We all have a parasympathetic. We share so much in common that, and I refer back to the scientific principle of Occam's razor quite often, which is all else remaining equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. So what is more likely to be true? That we are the only species living here on planet earth that are literally alien, foreign, unlike, too different to fit in, to connect, or We all share the same basic language pathways as well. And at one time, not so long ago in our own species history, communicating across species boundaries was as natural as breathing. It's only in the last hundred years or so when we have slowly, steadily, well, not slowly, quickly replaced our connections with one another and even with our animal companions, with our smart devices and our robotics and our conveniences and our artificial indoor living situation, that we have isolated ourselves. We have forgotten how connected we really are. And looking at the studies, I mean, now we're in a situation where we actually need scientific researchers to tell us that spending two hours a week in nature is healthy for us because we've forgotten. And yet you look at our habits when we go on vacation, you look at our choice of pastime when we have free time, we naturally gravitate to nature. We naturally gravitate to animals and we naturally gravitate to love. Love activates empathy, which literally means to suffer with. That leads to compassion, which literally means to take passionate action on behalf of. We naturally gravitate back to spirit, our our, our core essence or way. And it strips away all of these other layers that aren't adding any real tangible value or happiness to our lives and reminds us of the healing power of connection and that we can find it not just with our own species, but with any species, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, birds, There's so much mystery here. And for me, that is the intersection. For so many of my pet parent clients, what I'm seeing right now is they come to me and they say something to the effect of, I have loved animals all my life, but I have never had an animal relationship like this. And a lot of times it's when that animal is crossing over. They're making their transition and something in that moment of, oh, I'm going to lose this one relationship that I literally cannot live without. And it's waking them up and opening them up and making them so brave to explore exactly what you're talking about here on quantum living. So this desire to connect and communicate, we can try in every which way to shut it off, but we can't because it's part of who we are. Thank you. You have beautifully explained this, and I totally agree. Now, you mentioned a very important aspect of our understanding of animals and our communication with with them, and that is emotions. Animal emotions is still pretty, even controversial topic, when you separate emotions or feelings beyond the instinct, which is well understood and accepted, and when we start talking about higher emotions, 
such as love, jealousy, sadness, grief, which normally we attribute only to humans. And yet we can see those emotions in animals in particular, in our pets, but also in wild animals that are kept in the zoos, which is another issue. <laughs> but at least we are able to observe them and, and study them, etc. So there is some, I guess, small benefit out of that. So my question is, what are your thoughts on higher emotions experienced by animals that we can see and have noticed and, and can relate to? And are you aware of any studies or research that has been done um, on this topic? Because it is it is sitting on the fence, <laughs> if you like, between, you know, believe it or not, kind of scenario, mainly because of, I would even say, human arrogance that, you know, only we highly evolved species, the highest evolved species, species have, you know, the highest consciousness and have those emotions and no other animals can have them. So could you please speak to this for a moment? This is such a good question. Oh my goodness. Who created the taxonomic charts that decided that the Homo sapiens was the apex predator? The smartest. Well, we we only understand our own kind of intelligence. We don't understand a being like the octopus that appears to have brain cells in every area of their body. We don't understand the intelligence of elephants that gather from hundreds of miles away to honor not just passing of their own kind, but of humans that have served them and cared for them well. We don't understand these kinds of intelligence. And so our efforts to rank them are at best ineffective and non-factual. I mean, if we're looking for science here, if we're looking for evidence, we're not going to find any. What we do find, and if we backtrack and kind of back the truck up all the way to the biological level, we understand that there is a biochemistry to emotion. We can track the biochemical markers for emotion. And this is one way, for instance, and I am blanking on the name of the researcher right at the moment, but he is doing studies with dogs who are trained to lie absolutely still and quiet inside MRI machines. And he is able to track areas of their brains that light up and reference different emotional centers, different types of emotions in response to certain stimuli. So we are able to track on certain levels that there are shared emotional pathways from a biochemical level. Now, can we, with any degree of actual accuracy, determine what is a higher level emotion versus what is a lower level emotion? I mean, there are shades of gray along spectrum extremes, but if we look at it from a, a psychological or perspective, we can look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs with the base and the triangle being meeting our survival needs for food, shelter, water, safety. And all the way up to the top of that triangle, we're looking at self-actualization. And we can see evidence for instance, Dr. Irene Pepperberg and her incredible research partner, Alex, the African, excuse me, yeah, the African gray parrot, Alex, the African gray parrot, who literally broke the glass ceiling for avian intelligence. And we've gone from using bird brain as an insult to using it as a compliment. And of course, we being humans, we're now saying, well, a dog or an avian is equivalent to a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a five-year-old human child. And here again, 
we are relating it back. I, I don't believe that personally speaking anyway, and this is just deeply personally, I don't believe that we mean any harm by it. We just don't have any other frame of reference. And so I believe the underlying motivation, if you will, is empathy is creating at that channel of understanding, which can lead to caring, which can lead to better treatment, which can lead to advocacy and activism for increased rights and the responsibilities that we have as stewards of this planet, like it or not, we sink or swim together. If we don't save this planet, if we don't take good care of it, we we lose just as much as any other species. I mean, I, I think the idea of visiting Mars is awesome, but I think we've got a pretty groovy <laughs> planet here. I'd like to try to save yeah. it. And we can only do that when we yeah. really start caring. And we can only really care when we have some semblance of understanding. And so I don't know that there's necessarily any particular higher purpose that that is served by digging down into the nuance of, well, do other do non-human animals love as much or as deeply as human animals? We have so much qualitative research pointing to the selfless acts of non-human animals on behalf of other non-human animals that are different from as well as the same as them. And on our behalf, whether we particularly earned it or deserved it or returned it or not. So taking a look at heroism, the carrier pigeon, pigeon, the homing pigeons that literally helped us stay alive during times of war, the canines that have selflessly, truly sacrificed themselves for the cause with 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 no question without questioning it what is in it for me i mean that is the highest emotion and so so i look at this and i think what feels better to see the highest and best that i can see in myself in another being if i didn't have it in myself i wouldn't even be able to imagine it in some somebody else so it says a lot of good stuff for me and it says a lot of good stuff for every other species my mom and I were just reading a study that is being done, and I don't have the full context, but it's on uh, carpenter ants. And there's a lot of evidence that's been gathered that when one carpenter ant is injured, their comrades, family, or fellow workers, and in this case, this is we're talking female ants, will come and they will either tend to the wound or if needed and, and, and possible, will amputate the limb and tend to the wound until the ant's injury heals so that that ant can go on living. That just blows my mind. Yes. And even stories that we hear every so often in the news about a pet dog waking up their parent in a house fire. So instead of running away, which would be their instinct, you know, run away from the fire, they would go to the bedroom and wake up people in the bedroom so that they can escape. I mean, that's that's far beyond and way beyond any instinct. And this is pretty much a sacrifice because it often happens that, you know, in the mayhem that, that follows, the animal actually perishes in the fire while having saved their parents or the owners. So that's quite evident. And when you were speaking about our caring for the planet, there are two words that come into my mind, and that is, or in fact, one word, which is a difference <laughs> between the two concepts, stewardship versus ownership. We are not the owners. We are the stewards of the planet and every living creature on it. Beautiful, beautifully said. Thank you so much. Now, 
there are courses and programs to learn animal communication, obviously, and especially with our pets and farm animals. But I know that many people, especially highly sensitive people, can intuitively understand their animals without any training. And they communicate with them at the energy level that we might call telepathy. <laughs> so how important is psychic sensitivity or this high sensitivity in our communication with animals? And are there any highly sensitive animals as well? <laughs> but that is a nuanced question. Yes, that's a very nuanced question because I'm I'm just for the purposes of our discussion here going to separate out the term psychic sensitivity and high sensitivity. Okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. High sensitivity is a documented genetic trait that occurs in about 20% of over 100 different animal species. So high sensitivity is a way of interacting with the environment, especially under a situation of threat. It has evolutionary advantages. High sensitivity looks like, let's say if there is, here's a common example in a, let's say we have a community of mice living out in a field somewhere in Africa and fire breaks out. 80% of the mice may choose to run in advance of the fire, hoping that they're going to outrun it. That's the non-highly sensitive population. That's their go-to evolutionary strategy. I'm not necessarily saying that I know what mice would do. <laughs> I'm just using this as an example. 20% of the mice, they take a little bit longer to make a decision. They watch, they stop, they look at what the 80% are doing, and they're thinking, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that. Instead, they tunnel, they go down underneath the earth and they run in their system, their, the system of underground barrows. And they decide they're going to keep running and hopefully they'll come out on the other side of the fire and they'll escape it through a different route. And so we can see the evolutionary advantages here, right? Hopefully one way or another, if the 80% don't make it, at least the 20% will. So this has been documented in humans in over a hundred different species. This is a population of animals that I work especially closely with and especially well with because I happen to be highly sensitive myself. And for your listeners who are like, what is a highly sensitive person or a highly sensitive pet? You might want to head over to Dr. Elaine Aaron. She's the founding researcher of the highly sensitive person temperament trait. And I've done a lot of work with the highly sensitive pet. So I have a highly sensitive pet help guide on my website under free tools and resources. So what we're looking at here as a high sensitivity individual being of any species is we tend to react more strongly to stimuli, lights, sounds, sensations, scents, flavors, feelings even inner knowings. We're just, our dials are turned up, naturally turned up a little higher. So that's high sensitivity. Psychic sensitivity, that's a different complementary, but different trait. We're looking at here, the intuitive pathways. So we've got our outer facing senses. So high sensitivity is in most cases, we're looking at outward stimuli coming at us, coming in. So with psychic sensitivity, we're looking at inward stimuli being received and expressed. So we've got our outward facing sight, our inward facing sight, our outward facing auditory, our inward facing auditory. So here's where we get into the clairs, the clear cognizance, the clear buoyance, the clear sentience, et cetera, et cetera. So these are our inward facing sensory pathways. And we have all met that person that just seems to know things before they're going to happen, or maybe they have um, they have dreams that predate actual events, or maybe you're listening right now and you're one of these people. You just have most of us have one or two psychic pathways or intuitive pathways that are a little more open and functional than all the others because those are the ones we've had to lean on early in life before we were verbal. 
before we learned what Don Miguel Ruiz calls the rules of polite society, aka domestication. We lean on our psychic senses very heavily. And so there is also an argument to be made that for those of us who believe that we reincarnate, that we develop our psychic sensitivity over lifetimes. Now, when you've got high sensitivity and and heightened psychic sensitivity that come together, when we're looking at someone who has very heightened psychic pathways and is also highly sensitive, we're looking at somebody that's going to need a lot of recharge time. And we can see this with pets as well as people. And I think it's especially prevalent in animals that work in service roles, like the animal you talked about earlier that senses the disaster, the fire in the home, and then works so tirelessly, not leave and preserve self, but to wake up their loves. The, the, the cat that knows exactly when the epileptic seizure is about to strike and warns their owner, the dog that is able to moderate the autistic child's outbursts and help them calm their nervous system. So these are the animals that are highly sensitive highly empathic to others. And also, I believe, psychically very sensitive and aware. Absolutely. Beauty. Yes, absolutely. I I totally agree. Thank you. Now, you mentioned reincarnation, which is a another lovely segue to, yes. <laughs> to my next point. Animal reincarnation is a fascinating topic. And when we chatted earlier, You mentioned that your pet has reincarnated with you quite a few times. So that's what I'd like to talk about. But before I ask you to share with us your thoughts on it, I'd like to share a couple of my own insights to start this topic. Firstly, I believe that the soul journey includes incarnations in every kingdom in the universe, from the mineral kingdom as crystals or rocks, to the plant kingdom, to the animal kingdom, as well as the ecosystems kingdom with the oceans, rivers, forests, and mountains. And even, I believe, the planets, moons, and the suns. And there are, of course, many other kingdoms in the universe we don't even know about. (laughs) But my point is that once we are born As a human, we have already lived in the animal kingdom. And so our connection with animals is permanent and it never ends. I still have memories of running as a wild horse across the prairie and as a little marsupial eating lychees, out of all things, on a tree somewhere in the Indonesian rainforest, which is fascinating. (laughs) So even from this perspective, we can't deny our inherent connection with the animals. Secondly, as pets have a special connection with humans, but a much shorter lifespan, I absolutely believe that often they want to come back to the same person as the same or even different species for whatever reason, or just out of love. (laughs) I haven't had such an experience with my own pets in my life, but I believe that you have. So could you please tell us about it? I most definitely have. I, and I love what you share about your memories. I think you could do all and should do a whole episode on that. That would be absolutely fascinating. (laughs) I love it. Mm. And I also really find myself fascinated by the resonance that so many of us pet parents have towards particular species, like you mentioned horses. And for me, it's always been parrots. I started begging my parents for a parrot when I was seven at a time when most kids might start begging for a a dog or a cat or maybe a horse. And I was just dead set on parrots. I wanted a parrot. And my first parrot, Perky, a parakeet, arrived when I was eight. 
And we were instantly best friends, instantly best friends. And he lived a tremendous long life for a parakeet, especially at that iteration of avian veterinary medicine when we knew next to nothing. He lived for almost, yes, ma'am. He lived for almost 12 years. And we were just inseparable. When I had a birthday, Perky had a birthday. When I had friends sleep over, Perky was always with me. And every family photo, when we had relatives visit, Perky was in the photo with me. We were just inseparable. And when Perky passed, I was at college and I went for several years not being able to have a pet of any kind. And when I finally resituated here in Houston again, one of the first things I did was I welcomed a cockatiel, a larger version of a parrot, of a parakeet into my life. And his name was Jacob. Now, Jacob came to me with a severe congenital kidney defect that was undiagnosed. And so he only lived for three years. And the last year of his life was nonstop trips to the vet. And when Jacob died, I said to myself, I was, I will never have another bird. I will never have another, another pet bird because I cannot take it. I cannot take the pain. Now, write about all of this in my memoir of my soul bird and my life together with my soul bird, Pearl. And when I lost Jacob, I was dead set against having another bird. And my mom and dad, who love animals, so I get it honestly, couldn't handle how sad I was because I was living with them at the time. And so they went scouting at local pet stores to try to find another cockatiel. And one day my mom called me and said, you have got to come to PetSmart. And I was at work and I was like, yeah, not going to happen. And eventually I had to cave because she wasn't going to, she wasn't going to take no for an answer. And when I walked in and I saw all these healthy cockatiels, I was like, nope, not doing this. Can't handle it. And then all of a sudden I saw this miserable little fluff, just totally bedraggled, totally walked all over, totally ignored and overlooked. And I kid you not, my hand just went out of its own volition. And this little bird crawled into my palm all the way up my arm and underneath my hair. And we stayed like that for 45 minutes. And that was my pearl. Runt of the litter, missing his left wingtip and three of his claws. They'd been bitten off by his siblings or parents. He was just nest bullied to within an inch of his life. We were inseparable for 21 years. And when, excuse me, we were inseparable for 24 years. Interesting. And he passed a year ago in January and I was not expecting it. In fact, the way he passed was almost exactly identical to the way that Jacob had passed. And I was, I was a wreck. I I was beside myself. I was, I think I went temporarily insane with grief. And this time However, I was an animal communicator. I had been trained in animal communication. I was practicing professionally. And somehow in the middle of my grief, Pearl got through to me and he said to me, mom, it's me and I'm rushing right back. I'm going to be a ladybird this time and my name will be Petal. And he showed me a picture of a bright yellow bird. And so it didn't take me very long to recognize that I had received a message from Pearl that he was reincarnating. And what was interesting is I was already assisting my pet parent clients with finding their reincarnated animals, but it was kind of in a detached way. Like I just didn't have a particularly personal connection What I did have was kind of a question mark in my own practice, because of course, a huge part of the practicum for formal study in animal communication is we do practice with our own pets, both in body and in spirit. And I'd always wondered why I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could connect with Perky or Jacob. 
I just didn't feel like I could really hear from them. And it wasn't until I went through the process of welcoming Pearl back as Miss Petal that I realized that it was because they're the same bird. And I'm not saying that there isn't a way to connect with animals at different stages of their evolution where they've had different personalities. That's absolutely the case. But this was a part of my teaching, like my own learning journey as a student, that Pearl, who is just the architect of so many amazing transformations in my life, wanted to teach me firsthand what it's like, what it can be like when when an animal that we love reincarnates to us. And what was so interesting was that everything he said not only came true. I mean, this is the craziest story. My mom got on the internet because, of course, she can't stand to see her daughter sad. She's like, we're going to go search for cockatiel babies. And it's December. Cockatiels don't mate and lay eggs in December. It's cold, at least here in Houston. And so everyone we called was like, yeah, sorry, you're going to have to wait till March. So she's scrolling up and down on the internet. And all of a sudden, I see see the words Robin's nest. And I said, wait, stop, go back. What is that? I love Robin's go back. So I call this woman up and I get Robin (laughs) on the phone and I say, do you have any cocktail babies? And she said, no, not until March. I was like, oh, and then she says, but I just found two eggs laid out of season. I had to move my avian air, my all my aviary birds indoors during the freeze that we were having. And I found two eggs and I don't know who laid them. And I don't know if they're viable. I've put them in an incubator in an incubator and I will keep you posted. She said, call me back in about a week and I'll tell you if they made it or if they're incubating, if they're alive. Well, two days later, I just knew this one of them was Pearl's new body. I knew it. It wasn't even 48 hours. And I got a text and she showed me that she was canceling the eggs and they were viable. Turns out only one of them made it. I've never had a ladybird before. And when I welcomed Petal, we still didn't know the gender because of course the DNA test got lost at the lab. So I really had to go on faith. And she came home and about a week later, the DNA results came back and yeah, she's a lady. And Robin sent me the photo of Petal's surrogate mom, the most experienced hen she had. And this was the pure yellow bird that he had sent me. Spitting image, the same yellow bird. And, you know, sometimes you can even get too woo for your own self, right? And I just thought, this is just amazing. And Petal is so different than Pearl. She's huge. She was tiny. She's fully flighted. He could never fly. She's got talons instead of claws. He didn't even have all eight of his claws. She's a ladybird. He was a boy, but she'll give me this look. And I just, the love, it's the, it's, it's the same. When you're joined at the beak, you're joined at the beak or the paw or the hoof. And you just know. And so it's become a particular passion of mine. And, you know, it was interesting. I was talking with a colleague the other day and she was saying, well, I've always believed that if your pet's going to reincarnate to you, that you don't have to look for them. They'll just find you. And I said, that is a really interesting perspective. I said, I have not experienced that to be the case with my clients or with myself, because in my experience, again, I can only talk from my personal experience, not definitely not invalidating what she said. I have no idea that could be the case, but for me personally, and for the clients that I work with, a pet reincarnating is an invitation to spirit evolution opening up our awareness of what is possible. And it requires what we can really call us either a sense of adventure, or if you have a faith background, a a leap of faith, following clues, trusting, taking that next step, opening up, growing up psychically or spirit, spirit wise. And so it, 
isn't quite so simple as just sitting and waiting and suddenly you get a knock at the door or you just walk into a pet store or whatever. Somebody says, hi, I've got your reincarnated pet. It That has not happened to me. For me, it is a process of we get clues and we can choose to trust them or not. We can choose to act on them or not. We can choose to follow them or not. And if we choose to trust, if we choose to act, if we choose to follow, then the likelihood of the reunion is very high, but it is an invitation to growth. Yes, beautiful, beautiful story. Thank you. Now, we are much more familiar with talking to our pets and even farm animals than to the wildlife. Do you work with wild animals and what's your advice on how to communicate with them if we need to? For example, when we encounter a wild animal when camping or traveling or we find them stranded in our backyard. And I'd like to share just very quick uh, personal story on this topic. Several years ago, I was driving home and I saw up in the sky, there was a fight, bird fight, which was really distressing to see. There was a a large bird, which looked like a bird of prey, that was being attacked by four or five other birds of other species in flight which was, as I said, very distressing. Anyway, a few minutes later, I got home. And when I went to my backyard, I saw that bird in my backyard. So out of, because I, I was actually quite concerned, I was thinking, well, what, what can I do? Because I could see that the bird was being injured by those other birds that attacking it. And lo and behold, the bird decided to land in my backyard. So I saw it on the ground. It was a large brown bird. I later found out it was a falcon. I quickly called uh, one of the local rangers and I told them, look, I've got this wild bird, etc." So they came in fairly quickly to collect it. And it was injured. One of its eye was almost taken out and it was in a very poor condition. So... I helped the ranger to gently catch it and put it in a cardboard box and he he took it to the vet. Uh, And he said that, look, I don't know whether the bird can be saved or whether it will need to be euthanized. But uh, either way, the bird was being taken care of. And then I was thinking, out of all the places, it didn't go to the nearby bushland. It didn't go. It came to my backyard as if it knew that I will take care of it. <laughs> so, which, and I still remember, and I, I'm still getting chills whenever I recall this, this experience. So could you share with us what are your thoughts on communication with wild animals and, and how we should approach this? This is such a great question. It brings up so much for me. We, we found a little baby mockingbird in our front yard this morning and rushed it to the wildlife center. And this is actually how my rescued box turtle Bruce came to me. It was a, a very similar story of a very deliberate, energetic choice on an animal's part where they sensed a resonance of being willing to help and sought us out. So this absolutely can happen. I often say that the animals know who can hear them and being able to hear them isn't a matter of training. There is a natural frequency. And often I find this plays out in times of crisis when there's a life at stake. And this is where some of these stories come from, like yours, where we just seem to be perfectly placed and even maybe have a little advance heads up like you did watching that bird fight so that when you got home and you found the falcon in your backyard, you weren't wholly unprepared. You had a little bit of a heads up from the universe, if you will, 
of what was waiting for you when you got home. And for me, this, this can happen for anyone who is movable, who is flexible, who is open-hearted, who cares, who connects, who's willing, who's able, willing to be of support when needed. Having said that, However, there are certain techniques that we can use. And I actually did a podcast a couple of weeks ago about this with a, a client of mine who was having a little rodent problem in her backyard. And she had hired me to talk with her dog in spirit. And at the very end of our conversation, she mentioned that there was a little rodent infestation going on around her bird feeders, and she didn't want to have to resort to rodent control or pesticides? And was there any other way? And I coached her on some very simple things that she could do to communicate with the rodents and encourage them to relocate. And lo and behold, it worked. And it's interesting because speaking of falcons, apparently the birds of prey were also listening in on that frequency when she was explaining to the rodents that they needed to move. And the message they got was free snacks. So they came right in and further encouraged the rodents to leave. So it's very interesting. You never know who might be listening when you are communicating with a wild animal. But if we can just gently just either switch off our left brain that's going, this isn't possible, you can't do this, or just you know distract it with something else and reach out and just share with the wild animals, like if pests people are coming or uh, we had squirrels in the attic that kept waking me up and I just communicated with them. And I said, look, if you don't leave, this is what's going to happen. And I don't want that to happen to you, but I've got to be able to get a good night's sleep. And they exited the next morning and we quickly called our handyman who came and boarded up the little area they were getting in tune and we were able to resolve it. So it doesn't take any training. It doesn't take any prior experience. It just takes a willingness to... An intuition, just... Exactly. Tune in and... And, and just to yeah. give it a try, just to say, yeah. hey, rats, we don't want to have to put out these icky things that might trap you or harm you in some way. However, <laughs> that's the next step. And so we can show the animal the next step and encourage removal. Now, I really love with smaller animals or, or beings, like, like for instance, ants. A lot of times ants will come inside a home because they're looking for water. Often the solution is as simple as tuning into why are the ants coming in? What are they looking for? And then we can just place a little dish of water outside. That's what they're looking for. They don't have to come inside to get it. I've, I've talked with clients who have had very good success with simple fixes like this. Again, going back to you, we're more alike than different. If you're in a big drought, there's nothing to eat, there's nothing to drink, and suddenly you have insects in your house, it's not a huge stretch to figure out why. Whether we have formal training in animal communication or not, you know, recognizing on the topic of that we were talking about earlier on just saving the planet and being a good steward of the planet and a good caretaker, we recognize that increasingly our species, like it or not, want to or not intended to or not, we're just repopulating the planet and we're taking over. And so increasingly we're taking spaces that were formerly home to other beings and we are using them for ourselves. And so then the call is how can we share this space? Yes, abs absolutely. Speaking of ants, I also had a an interesting experience with ants that was again several years ago. I started getting ants coming through the window or you know the little space you know in, in the window frame to the kitchen to the point that it became really concerning. <laughs> So what I did, and it was just an insight I received from the spirit. What I did one day, I just tuned in because ants have a collective soul. So I tuned in to them, to their soul, and I basically communicated 
to them my request that they leave my house because there was really nothing here for them and their presence created some issues. And I basically said very nicely in my telepathic communication, <laughs> please leave and you'll be happy over there in the gardens and I'll be happy in here inside. We'll all be happy just living our own lives without disturbing each other because otherwise I have to spray it and I'll have to, which will kill you, etc., etc. And I don't want to do this. Within 24 hours, they were gone. <laughs> and when I mentioned this to my friend, she said, really? Nah, you must have sprayed. I said, no, I simply talked to the ants and I asked them very nicely, but firmly, <laughs> could you please leave my house and move over there because that's where you live and I live here. And they listened and they agreed and they left. I love it. She couldn't believe it. I love it. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think that we could all write books, literally, and I'm sure that some people have had written books about these sort of experiences because they are empirical evidence Absolutely. of the effectiveness of our telepathic mm -hmm. communication with the animal kingdom. And it's very difficult to refute it. Absolutely. Okay, lovely. Now, Shannon, do you have any particularly interesting, unusual or funny case studies <laughs> of animal communication that you could share with us? I have to say, this is my all-time favorite. It, it just, it took my breath away when it happened. And I have not stopped telling the story since one day, and this was actually one of my very first pet re, pet reincarnation, pet parent clients. And she came to me wanting to reconnect with her dog and spirit chief, who was this beautiful black German shepherd. And I always get to know the animal first in this in the spirit space before I start asking any particular questions, whatever the pet parent wants to know. And as I began interacting with Chief, the German Shepherd, he started jumping around and barking and waving his his paws around and waggling his ears and wagging his tail. And I literally said to him, What are you doing? I had no idea what to do with this display. And he said to me, how many languages do you know? And I said, one, maybe two, if you count animal communication. And he said, I'm teaching you German shepherd. And he was just doing all of it. And he started doing the movements again and just wriggling his body and waving his ears and wagging his tail. And it was just the most joyful experience for me to have. Did you explain what this meant? All those movements? No, I didn't need an explanation. Need... He was showing me okay. his language, okay. how he communicated using his whole body. It was so marvelous. And I did get, I did receive the understanding that it would be a study, you know, it wouldn't be like I could watch him for five minutes and become fluent in German Shepherd. He was show, he was giving me a little sneak peek into his language of German Shepherd. And I just loved it. So it turned out he was a real teaching spirit, is a real teaching spirit. And he has since joined my light team, which is a whole different comp topic of conversation, but he will come in when I'm having trouble connecting with an animal or an animal's really shy or isn't quite clear about what animal communication is. I want to say he will come in and assist. So another very favorite story I have, this was, a, this was one I actually wrote about in Reiki News Magazine. And this was a Chihuini, a Chihuahua dachshund mix named Ori. And Ori was diabetic. Ori is now in spirit, but Ori was diabetic and Ori needed daily insulin shots. Ori's mom, Kristen, worked out of the home during the day. And so she could give Ori his shots before she left the house and at night, but she could not give them in the middle of the day. And so she would have her sister come over. She would have a neighbor come over. Sometimes she would board Ori at the vet for the day to get checked up and they would give the shot. 
And every time somebody other than Kristen would come to give Ori his insulin shot, which he administered subcutaneously. So it's just in that lower layer of skin. Ori was a perfect angel. He would stand still. He wouldn't move a muscle. He would let them give the shot. But as soon as Kristen tried to come and give Ori his shot, he would wriggle. He would wiggle. He would dance, he would bark, he would bite, he would do all kinds of things. And Ori, Ori was driving Christian crazy. She was so worried he was going to miss getting his medication because he was moving too much. So she came to me and asked me if I could explain, please, to Ori to stand still. And so I asked Ori, why are you moving about with Kristen and you're standing still for everyone else? And his reply blew me away. He said, I'm trying to make it fun for her. She comes to me with this shot and she's so unhappy and she's so nervous and she's so anxious and I'm trying to lighten up the mood. I'm trying to get her to smile. So it was just this classic case of, of miscommunication. And as soon as Ori understood that this wasn't helping and, and that he needed to, to stay quiet, he didn't need to cheer her up in that moment. He needed to, what would cheer her up is if he stood still. He was a perfect angel. Lovely stories. Thank you for sharing. Well, Shannon, time is catching up with us. So I'd like to ask you my final question. Of course. You also have your own podcast, Let's Talk to Animals. And you also offer various workshops and programs on your website. Could you please tell us about your work and your offerings and how people can connect with you to access them? And of course, I will include all the links in the show notes on my podcast website so that people can access them. But could you please speak to your offerings? Of course. Thank you so much for asking. So the easiest way to find me is animallovelanguages.com. You can also head over to Instagram at love and feathers and shells or at animal love languages. And that's also my handle on Facebook, YouTube. My handle is my name, Shannon Cuts. I offer one-to-one sessions in both animal communication for pets here in their body and in the spirit space. And I offer pet Reiki. So this is often, for my pet parent clients at least, this is kind of the intro to animal communication by experiencing it firsthand. And then many of my personal one-to-one clients transition into my animal communication adventure student program and then into my graduates only practice circle. So there there is something for everyone at any stage of your journey of evolving your and deepening your connection and your relationship with animal. And in my student program, we connect with our own pets. We connect with other people's pets and we connect with wild animals. So there's a chance to experience a a broad, if not, I'm not going to say every angle of the spectrum, but definitely a broad spectrum of different types of communication. So pet Reiki, a lot of times people will seek me out. In fact, I'm treating one dog right now who's going through her third round of chemotherapy. So we're using Reiki and some additional energetic treatments to keep her strong and keep her balanced as her body fights the cancer. We have, um, I've got several case studies of using Reiki and other energy treatments very successfully for animals that are dealing with different kinds of medical as well as, and also emotional issues. So there's really, there's a lot, there's a lot of resources on, on the animal love level excuse me, animallovelanguages.com website. I have a resources section with free tools and you can also access the Let's Talk to Animals podcast, which I'm excited to welcome you to. We're doing a sister episode over there. And so I'll make sure to link to this episode as well on my podcast, but you can find Let's Talk to Animals right on the homepage of my website. You can also find it over on Buzzsprout and on your favorite streaming service. We are in our, we are in our fifth season now. So I've interviewed 
fellow practitioners and holistic practitioners and light workers all over the world. And I've also shared a wealth of stories from my client practice and my own personal experiences with animal communication. So it's a lot of fun and I encourage you to join us. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I've listened to your podcast and I can highly recommend it. And yes, and I'm thrilled to be your guest on it as well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Shannon, thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us to leave our audience with any final thoughts? Well, I just encourage you, if you're not really sure where to start or you think you've been having some intuitive level connections with animals, or you just resonate with a bright petal, or you resonate with a particular species to just give your left left brain mind a little break from having to overthink it and just connect in from your heart. Just open your heart. And you were talking earlier about that powerful channel of love. And Often when we simply connect with our heart and we allow ourselves to really feel the love that we have for a particular animal, for a particular land mass, for a particular geographic area, for a particular wild animal, so much magic takes place. We can open pathways we had no idea we had any access to. Another great way to start engaging at a deeper level is to just, when you wake up in the morning, just say, may I be of service to whatever wild animal, whatever animal, whatever fellow being here on planet earth may need me for just allow me to be moved. Allow me to see, allow me to hear, allow me to know what is needed and how I may serve, how I may help. So that's a really great place to start. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Shannon. It's been such a pleasure to have this amazing conversation with you on quantum living. And again, I'm looking forward to speaking with you on your podcast. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, you might also like my conversation with Shannon from a slightly different angle on her podcast, Let's Talk to Animals, that she has mentioned. Thank you so much, Shannon, and all the best. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then... Keep your vibrations high and be well.